Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas book review time it is. I haven't been reviewing books for a while, so it is a good time to return to my good old habit. And today I'm actually bringing you two books, not one. And uh, you will see the reason why right away, because I've got two books by New in Chess Publishing about two world champions. The first one is, uh, well, let's go chronologically. Uh, in chronological, uh, chronological order is Max Oves, Best Games, written by Jan Timman. And then the other one is Spassky's Best Game, written Best Games, written by Alexei Bezgodov and Dimitri Olenikov. So these are the two beauties that I'm going to review today. And um, as you can figure, there is a reason why I decided to bundle them up. Same publisher, obviously they are part of a series, so why not Coconut? I have been having a jolly good time with both books, although I must add that they are quite different in structure. Spassky. The book on Spassky is um, really, really cool. Um, a way I really liked, uh, about what I really liked about this is the way how it was written, which is quite different from what you expect from a game selection. And the reason why it is quite unique and quite cool is it's because the first hundred or so pages of the book is exclusively chess history. Hardly any chess at all. The occasional diagrams just for reference so that you know where, this histo where the story is um, currently at, but really not much chess and a lot of stories, uh, anecdotes, just really awesome reading. Uh, I have uh, read a lot about Spassky on that 100 pages that I never knew about uh, the world champion. And then the second part of the book is the game selection when the two authors do a tremendously great job at analyzing the crucial games of uh, Boris Spassky. Um, one thing that stood out for me that I particularly liked about the book uh, in the, but I don't want to spoil it for you, in the first part, which once again I read with immense joy and pleasure, was that <laughs> Spassky was quite a funny dude actually. Um, and uh, he had some little jokes uh, such as that uh, Florencio Campomanes, uh, Fide president uh, back in the um, 70s, 80s. He called him Karpomanes, uh, obviously for his uh, uh, leaning toward Karpov, favoring Karpov in many, many cases. <laughs> he just referred to Florencio Campomanes as Karpomanes. Um, I found it quite amusing, as did I uh, find it amusing to discover that uh, Spassky's preparation for the Fisher match was, um, let's just say, lacking. I don't exactly want to tell you the daily routine of what they followed um, in their training camp with, with, with his coaches, but it's well worth reading um, Spassky's best game, not only for the games, but for the remarkable history and history lesson that you get to read about the world champ. Now, as for the other book, Max Irvin's Best Games. This was only written by one author and who would be more suitable to write about uh, the greatest Dutch chess legend than the second greatest Dutch chess legend. Sorry, Anish, uh, but that is still Jan Timman, uh, like it or not. And uh, indeed, Jan Timman has done a fabulous job of uh, collecting uh, not only really, really cool games, but of course, lots of information about um, Holland's only world champion. And a fun fact for you, pretty much the only world champion in history uh, who was an amateur throughout their life. I mean, probably the first world champions, although they did make some money out of chess, but back then professional chess wasn't quite a case. But by the 50s, it was absolutely unheard of that the very, very top of the chess elite uh, would not make good enough money to make a living out of chess. Of course, it was Fisher's impact and influence on the chess world in general that sort of raised the level of uh, respect, really, for chess um, to the status where it was actually beginning to get um, really well paid and to be a lucrative endeavor. Um, but um, yeah, Max Uwe was definitely a chess amateur throughout his entire chess career, which actually um, is um, more than 50 years. In fact, Uwe was one of the few world champions who um, visited Australia. In fact, he visited Canberra here, and um, I think he gave a lecture at the ANU, the Australian National University. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I will instead show you a game from the book played by Uwe 
Timman multiple times throughout the book refers to the fact that Owen was an underrated attacker who had a very good sense for initiative and attack. And uh, I have always struggled in my head uh, sort of placing Owen correctly in the food chain of world champions and what sort of style and chess he represented. Um, still do a little bit, but um, this one is definitely a testament, testimony or a testament to indeed that um, to the fact that indeed his uh, attacking skills were quite sharp. This is a game against up and coming Dutch grandmaster um, Hein Donner. Um, by this stage, Uwe was um, sort of behind or rather past his peak, but still. As you can tell from the game, he was a very, very sharp customer. King's Indian on the menu. Uh, actually, Uwe played a fair bit of King's Indian with Black, which again uh, indicates that the guy did enjoy a fair bit of aggro chess. And we are going into this classical G3 uh, variation, which um, was very, very popular. 50s, 60s, uh, Petrosian played it with white, Portish played it with white. Um, Botvinnik played it with white, Smyslov played it with white, so yeah, this was definitely a very popular variation back in uh, the day. Nowadays, of course, top grandmasters tend to go towards uh, mainline bayonet attacks and the likes, but uh, fashion, fashion is, is a fun thing in chess. Anyway, back to the game. Queen c7, a little bit timid, but it has a clever idea behind it, and that was this very unusual pawn um, march forward, pawn lunge b5. A very unexpected move because usually the structure is that we take and then we play a5 and we chuck the knight on c5, yada yada yada. And we have this really, really stock standard um, King's Indian structure. Bronstein was an absolute god of this, by the way, with the black pieces. But instead over here went b5, which simply is uh, exploiting the trick that after take stakes, the queen is... Uh, Awkward it plays on c2. What I was going to try to say is that the knight is pinned, but since I started with the queen, it was very difficult to finish the sentence meaningfully. So the knight on c3 is pinned to the queen, b4 is pending. This is not really looking great. And so Donner played his c5, which is the correct response. Um, and now things got really, really sharp real quick. Black took, and then a trade took place on e5. And in this position, the author of the book, Jan Timman, mentions that if it was only about structure of course f4 would be the correct move here because that sets uh the four pawns in motion against the three here and f4 e5 is a very common theme in fact there are multiple variations in the fianchetto king's indian where white sacks with c5 and then builds a strong kingside attack but unfortunately here f4 is going to be a tattoo late to the party after queen h5 and the preferred move was bishop f4 when after queen h5 e5 bishop f5 and queen d2 um black is in some sort of trouble because we will inevitably have to sack a piece here and whether that's gonna be sufficient or not the compensation that is that we are going to get for it the engine is not a big fan here it doesn't indicate black's loss but uh, it's a solid edge for white Instead, Donner went f4, and what comes now is a really, really spectacular fireworks that feels like it just comes out of nowhere. Watch this, queen h5, e5, and boomski, bishop takes h3. Now, obviously, you do reckon with this when you play e5, but even so, it really still feels like this attack, especially when you see how it unfolds, was just coming out of nowhere. Takes f6, takes back. And now we have got multiple threats. Bishop e d4 check is super duper annoying. And also note that after um, bishop takes g2, we cannot take back with the queen because then bishop takes c3 hangs the rook on d1. But also know that after bishop takes king takes, bishop takes. If the queen retakes on c3, sorry, then the rook hangs still. If the pawn retakes on c3, then rook e2 check picks off the queen. Oopsie daisy. So already it does feel very, very awkward. And so um, Donner tried to clog up the e-file to take the sting out of the attack. And so we went like, okay, baby, I can take that too. Now that is a big wowzers because of course we all see that queen e4 is met by queen d1. But just to casually throw in a rook like that and then what after bishop e4, not so simple. Especially if we see that bishop d4 check can always be met by rook d4. 
and White retains an extra piece. But that was not uh, Uwe's plan. Uwe just went like, okay, well, I can bring more attackers to the party. And it turns out that Black is attacking with four and White is defending at best with three. So what on paper looks like a rook down feels like a piece up. And that's how attack in general, by the way, in chess works. That for now, when the position is extremely dynamic and there are direct tactical threats, the only correct way to count material is, is if you don't count these... Uh, I will try to give it a different color. Yeah, if you don't count the green guys, because they are not participating in any of the lines. Which is exactly why, by the way, Donna played here... Um, well, not here, but... Oh, didn't he play bishop e3? No, I wanted to show you what happens if bishop e3. That's right. So if bishop e3, then we have got this sensational idea of bishop f5. Skewering now both of the bishops. Bishop f5 is forced. And of course, we don't bother retaking. We take on e3. And now rook takes g3 is a terminal. Absolutely decisive threat. It has to be defended. And after queen f5, black is down in exchange, but has got 47 pawns for it. And uh, the attack with bishop d4 uh, is going to decide the game to black's favor. So, um, after um, rook e8, Donna played rook e1. Obviously, this is also a handy looking move because it removes the rook from under attack. Unfortunately, however, it does place it in the middle of a pin. Needless to say that our good friend Uwe does not need an invitation to exploit the pin. And again... The main threat is the bishop d4 check. And then I won't be able to block on e3 with either without losing e4. Super annoying. So Donner plays queen g2, trying to shield the king from further checks. A good demonstration of that would be, just to be clear, that if I went check and they played king f1, then uh, there will be problems here. That is a fairly sizable oopsie daisy, yeah? Ouch. So Queen G2 is trying to prevent at least some of these super aggressive attacking ideas, if I can find a move. The downside, however, is, is that it still doesn't quite avoid the catastrophic outcome after Bishop takes E4, Rook E4, and Bishop D4 check. Sublime chess. Note... That now after rook takes d4, the win, of course, is rook check, rook check, picking of the queen. And that is really, really nasty. That is really nasty. And so white here tried to bail out with bishop e3. But after bishop takes king f1, rook e4, queen e4, and queen h3 check. There was not a lot left in the tank. After king e2, bishop d4. In my opinion, prematurely, but White threw in the towel and gave up the game. Once again, Black has got uh, seven pawns against four for the exchange. The fifth pawn is hanging. It is a miserable position. Ah, sorry, the sixth is hanging too. Not a lot to be done. Um, and Donna resigned. A very, very exciting attacking games. And uh, the book is full of many of these and, of course, some positional masterpieces, including Uwe's victories against uh, world champions such as Alakine in the world championship match but also against Capablanca and even against uh, the mysterious Indian uh, Mir Sultan Khan who defeated Capablanca and then Uwe defeated Sultan Khan right after that so yeah there are there are a fair few good games to this guy's name and uh, once again it is definitely a worthy um, addition to anyone's uh, chess collection do I recommend these books? Most definitely, especially those who collect books, because these two chess books are definitely um, a pride to any chess book collection, but they do have outstanding value on their own right. I really, really loved the Spassky chess history bit, and I really appreciated Jan Timman's incredibly thorough research and hard work that he put into putting finally together a book on Uwe and his games um, with up-to-date, top-end, high-quality analysis, um, really thorough comments, and just an overall a really, really nice collection of games analyzed by one of the greatest. So, once again, um, two world champions, two game collections, both released by New In Chess not so long ago. 
um, highly recommended on both accounts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be me now with this book review. There will be another one coming soon, at least one that I have prepared. So stay tuned. Please don't forget to sub, to comment um, and to like the video. And I'm going to be back soon. Thanks for watching.